Hey everybody, good morning. Pastor John here from New Life Church in Owaco, Washington, and this is the message for Sunday, August 13th, 2023. Now there are a lot of directions that this message could go today. We're looking at Ephesians 5, 1 through 20. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and go to Ephesians 5. And if you really read the text from uh, verses 1 through 20, then you see that it is a solid repeat of last week's message. Oh, good, we're done. We can just go back and look at last week. It emphasizes some of the thoughts on uh, purity and holiness, the way we live our lives. And it, and it really talks about replacing the destructive actions of self and instead focusing on living for the Holy Spirit. And in those ways, it's very much like what we talked about last week. And while there are certain passages that I want us to consider today, and we will uh, overlap with what we talked about last week, today I want to look at a very root, foundational idea that can be found in our text. For just a minute, I want you to consider Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. It reads, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now for just a minute, I want you to let that sink in. If I need to read it again, I will, but really just focus on this part. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. I want you to take that idea and I want you to just wallow in it. I mean, it should cover you. It should permeate you. It should become part of who you are. Because that, this little passage from Ephesians 5, this should be the filter through which we strain all of our words. It should be the standard that we use to judge our own actions. And with this thought in the forefront of our mind, I want us to continue but now let Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 infuse itself into everything else we read. Verse 3, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. He can be sure that no immoral, excuse me, no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and God. For a greedy person is an, is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in these things like other people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. And so again, there's definitely overlap with last week. Take the destructive behaviors, replace them with service to the Holy Spirit, doing what we're supposed to be doing. But at first glance, you might be looking at this thinking, oh great, another list of things we're not supposed to be doing. But instead... I want you to look at this list again within the context of verses 1 and 2. Let there be no sexual immorality, whether we're talking about adultery, fornication, or any other sin that Scripture considers deviant. The result's the same. Those actions are hurtful. They are potentially harmful to you. These are actions that are dangerous and should be avoided. So let's just focus on adultery for just a minute. Again, now look at it through the uh, context of verses 1 and 2. There's a broken vow. That's a broken heart. With a broken vow and a broken heart, there's no love in that. That's certainly not following the example of Christ. Plus, there's the potential to bring back dangerous diseases into your marriage bed. Instead, if you're loving sacrificially, you know, like Jesus then you wouldn't be participating in that sin. With fornication, it's not much different. There's similar consequences. If you're engaged in behavior that's uh, premarital and not with the person who's ultimately going to be your spouse, then you are removing 
for sure something that was supposed to be shared and special with your spouse and your spouse alone. That's hurtful. And that certainly doesn't line up with Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And then that whole disease thing? Yep, that's prevalent too. And it's just as big a threat. Sacrificial love. You know, the kind that Jesus exemplified? It dictates that we put our carnal desires on hold that we set that aside and that we preserve our union for our future spouse. Now, again, we can find similar cause and effects relationships with all the sexual behaviors that contradict God's word. It doesn't take very long to see that the reason that God gave us the instructions that he did is for our protection and our safety. Because he loves us. Crass and offensive language. It was mentioned last week. There's nothing that reflects the sacrificial love of Christ in lazy, foolish, or hurtful language. Instead, look at the example of Christ. He provided wisdom with his words. He provided encouragement with his words. There was restoration and even correction. But all of that, all of that was grounded and rooted in love. And then Paul calls out another sin here that... I believe all of us should consider maybe at work in our lives. Greed. Now on the surface, you're probably thinking, no way, pastor, I'm not a miser, I'm not a Scrooge, that's not me. But how many of us have excess when the people in our community, the people that we're supposed to be ministering to, are struggling with basic necessities? John the Baptist taught us in Luke 3.11, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. If we critically consider the things, the possessions that we have, do we have too much? Now, I'm not suggesting that we all take vows of poverty or that we have to sell everything we have and, and give all of the money to the poor. I'm not even suggesting that you have to give away all of your coats except for one. What I'm asking you is to look critically at what you have. Do you have so much of something that it goes unused, whether it's food or clothing or anything else? What if that could be used to bless someone else? I mean, truthfully, that's not even sacrificial love. That's just loving like Jesus. Perhaps the stuff in question is food or clothing. But what about toys and tools? Things that we never or even rarely use. Maybe those items could be used to value some, could be used by someone else and it would have value. But more likely, I would suggest that you sell those items and use the money in a way that benefits the kingdom of God. If it's something that could be given away, for example, a tool, that might be something that could be used by someone in your community so that they could enhance their life. Maybe it helps them get a job. Maybe it helps them keep a job. Maybe it helps them do a job. You know, the whole concept of teaching a man to fish, that was certainly something that we see Jesus employ in his ministry. And again, I'm not telling you to go sell all your camping gear just because you haven't used it in a couple of years. But I do want you to look at it critically and say, is this something that I could be using for the kingdom of God? Is there a way that I could use this to minister, disciple, to lead someone else, to spend time with someone so that they can grow to spiritual maturity because they're being discipled through the use of these tools that have just been sitting for the last couple of years? And then if we skip down to the end of Ephesians 5, we get a great example of this whole sacrificial love thing playing out. In, in Ephesians 5, 21, it says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle 
or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again... I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There's a lot of people that miss the instruction here. In fact, they heard the submit to their husband's part, and immediately the defenses came up, and they probably weren't even listening to anything else that I read. And I'm afraid that modern feminism has actually tried to pervert the order that God was trying to put in place here. And I would ask you for just a minute to take the defenses down. And I want you to consider a couple of things. First off, consider the audience. Who's Paul writing to? If you've been with us this whole time, then you know that Paul was writing to a church that's in a community that's being impacted culturally by the worship of the goddess Artemis. And who was she again? The goddess of, I'm a strong, independent lady woman, and I don't need no man? Yeah, you see where we're at. This is who Paul is writing to. So set aside the defensive response and look at this passage again through the lens of sacrificial love. As a wife, it means submitting in all ways to the loving leadership of your husband. Amen, preacher. You tell her. You tell my woman she has to do what I say. Well, hang on there, buddy. Are you being the leader that she needs? Are you loving her as Christ loved the church? And I would ask you to consider that that was a sacrificial love to the point of death. Are you willing to make sacrifices to ensure that she is successful? Are you ensuring that she is holy and clean, washed in the cleansing of God's word? In other words, are you leading your home in all aspects of faith? Are you providing godly counsel and wisdom to your children? Are you taking your family to church not sending them to church are you taking your family to church are you sir personally submitting to the holy spirit in all aspects of your life are you submitting to church leadership and trying to grow into spiritual maturity you know, remember last week's message so that you can be the leader that your family needs see marriage isn't supposed to be about control look at the text again Look at it again through the lens of Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Is that the way your marriage is built? If it's not, it's an error. Are you doing everything you can, sir, to ensure that your wife has the resources that she needs to succeed? You can't expect her to be a Proverbs 31 wife if you're unwilling to be an Ephesians 5 husband. As we close this morning, I want to look at one more thought from Ephesians 5. And again, let's look at it through the context of verses 1 and 2. Go back to verse 10. In verse 10, it says, Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. We've been talking about a clash of cultures, and I would just ask you to remember, what's at the center of that? Who is our clash really with? Our clash is with the enemy, the devil. And people who have hardened their hearts against God, they are capable of great evil. They do incredibly heartless, merciless things. But I want you to consider their love of Christ, the sacrificial love of Christ. Jesus is sometimes portrayed as a pacifist, 
And when he was on earth, there were some aspects of his ministry that certainly fall into that category. But in some points, it's taken too far. And people portray him as a weakling. Jesus was certainly not a weakling. Look at his own words from Matthew 10, verse 34. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. You see, the reason that there will be division is because the world wants to keep participating in its sin. Darkness tries to stay in the darkness so that it will not be exposed. But Jesus, Jesus is a rescuer. He's a liberator. He has come to set the captives free. He's willing to kick the doors down to do it, both spiritually and physically. If we're really loving our neighbors sacrificially like Jesus, then we must be willing to expose sin. We must be willing to take a stand to shine the light on it and say, this is wrong. Call evil, evil. And then take action against it. Wait, Pastor, are you calling us to violence? No, I'm not. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, I'm asking you to act in love and to follow the example of Christ. It's okay to tell someone, go and sin no more. It's okay to tell someone that an action is sinful and they shouldn't be participating in it. Call evil evil and then use whatever platform you can to rally others in the public against the exploitation of other people. Make calls for justice. Some of you need to be running for political office. That is the call that the Holy Spirit has put on your life and I think you're running from it because you're afraid of the changes that it's going to bring, the focus that it's going to put on you and on your family. But if that's what the Holy Spirit's calling you to do, then you need to move in that area. Bring the Lord back into places of power and authority. Live out the example that Christ said and that's talked about in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, in every aspect of your life. That includes politics. And remember that Jesus was willing to give his life to free us from the bondages of sin. It may be necessary for us to put our life on the line in obedience to the Holy Spirit if it means rescuing and restoring others. Be prepared to obey the Holy Spirit. He doesn't always call us to safety. He calls us to obedience. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, so grateful for those who have decided to watch the message today. And I, I pray, Father, that your word will just be infused into our hearts. That we will get this message from Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And we'll be able to apply it to every aspect of our life. Let us look critically at everything that we have and what we do. And make sure that we are living a life grounded and rooted in love that follows the example of Jesus. Give us a strength and a courage to obey you, Lord, to go into places where you've called us to be, to be the ministers you've called us to be, so that we can see your kingdom advance, so we can see those who are in bondage set free, so that we can see those who are exploited set free, so that we can see your love on display in our community. Father, use us. Let us be your willing vessels in our communities. Let this be a daily thing as we walk in the example of Christ and let your love impact others that we encounter. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.